biblical perspectives on the news is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning and welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. My name is Alan Deal. I'm currently on the board of the Interreligious Council of Lynn County and also serve as the Vice President of the Humanists of Lynn County. On this morning's show, we're going to dis discuss the current state of women's reproductive rights, both in Iowa and throughout the world, a very important subject for, for many people. Uh, here to discuss those, uh, this topic with us this morning is uh, Ray Faring and Linda Waddington, two distinguished, two, two distinguished guests. And uh, I'd like you to start out by just introducing yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you do and why this subject is important to you. Uh, well, I'm a communications manager at Planned Parenthood of the Heartland. Um, and obviously, working at Planned Parenthood and being a woman, um, women's reproductive health is, is extremely important to me. Excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. And I'm a columnist and member of the editorial board at the Gazette, and I've written quite extensively about experiences in my own life involving reproduc reproductive health care, and um, very interested in it from just the idea of, I'm not sure how women get ahead, I'm not sure how women advance in society um, without that type of access to health care. Excellent, and I think that really gets us into my first question, and I'll, I'll pose this to both of you, and Ray, you can certainly s jump in here, but have so how have societies benefited from women having access to reproductive health care? Uh, well, um, well, first and foremost, I mean, I think that access to reproductive health care um, helps women to be able to contribute in multiple ways to culture and society and gives them uh, access to economic opportunity. And with access to those opportunities, because they have control over their reproductive health, they're able to um, contribute to society in, in myriad ways. And, and being able to decide whether or when to, to have children really plays a key role in that. Linda, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I totally agree with everything Ray just said. Um, it, when we look around the world, we look in countries where there isn't access to reproductive health care. I mean, that's when we can really see how well industrialized nations have it. Um, when you can't space your children properly, you know, it leads to earlier deaths for women. Um, it leads to more impoverished conditions for the children. Um, and when you can't delay, when you can't delay, how do you go to school? You know, how do you advance within your own career? Um, and I know some women want to get married very quickly. They want to have children very quickly. Um, but it doesn't always work that way. You know, you might end up with infertility issues. And then you're still in the same boat as everyone else that you need access to the health care in order to meet and fulfill your dreams. Right. So I think, you know, and you read different things. And, and times have changed, right? I mean, women are no longer... Uh, you know, once they leave the house, it's no longer, now it's time to have babies, right? Now they have more power to take control of their lives, of their career, and having, of course, children later in life and fewer children. I mean, this just really has opened up the door for what is possible for uh, women in this country and throughout the world. And certainly there's obviously challenges that they still face. But um, now coming back to you, Ray, and, and your involvement with Planned Parenthood, um, could you, uh, obviously Planned Parenthood is at the kind of the tip of the spear when it comes to addressing the need for women's health care. Um, can you talk a little bit about Planned, Parenthood, Planned Parenthood's mission um, and you know, what services they do provide? Sure, um, the mission of Planned Parenthood is to promote provide and protect sexual and reproductive health care um, and education uh, in uh, obviously here in Iowa and, and that's what we do um, globally. Um, about 2% of our services are abortion health care services and the other 98% of the work that we do is really in reproductive health care in general. So um, STD testing and treatment, um, preventative cancer screenings, um, regular pap tests, things like that. So that's the kind of health care that we provide. And then we also do uh, educational programs, so across the state. Um, in fact, this past year, I believe that our education 
uh, staff had over 2,800 or nearly 2,800 educational programs and reached around 43,000, almost 43,000 um, youth, adults, professionals, um, with all of our different sexual health and educational curriculum, uh, which includes abstinence-based education, um, healthy relationships, um, healthy boundaries, uh, how to be an askable adult. Mm, um, so yeah, helping, helping adults to be able to be uh, folk, uh, people that young people can turn to when they have questions. Well, you know, that's interesting. Um, do you think there is a, a stigma, or still a stigma around sexual health, uh, sexual health care, having that discussion, whether it be, as you mentioned, parents with their children or in the school or, you know, sex education that's been controversial? I mean, do you still face challenge, headwinds there? Oh, and Linda certainly can chime yeah, in on this ahead. as well. Yeah, but. definitely. I mean, I think that um, our current political climate uh, and the, the routine and regular dangerous attacks on reproductive health care, not just in Iowa, but across the country, um, is clear evidence that there is still some stigma around not only uh, access to reproductive health, but also um, sexual health education. Interesting. And yeah. why do you think that is, Linda? Well, I was just going to say, I think when you, you look at Planned Parenthood, I think you there's kind of a duality to it. You kind of have this Planned Parenthood, you know, that you hear about on the news. And then you have these times like when my doctor aged out with her pediatrician and we knew that she had PCOS, which is polycystic ovary syndrome. And basically what that means is if she doesn't regulate her menstruation, um, she could have problems with infertility later on. So when she aged out with her pediatrician, Planned Parenthood was there for her. And we went to the office here in Cedar Rapids and were able to uh, get the birth control that she needed to keep herself healthy. And it was just like going to any other doctor. So you have this Planned Parenthood and you have this Planned Parenthood, which is, it's just a strange duality yeah. for it. I, I would also add that there's, um, there, there's additional stigma. You just spoke about your daughter, but I think that the, there are also um, other issues that, that people don't talk about um, in, in terms of sexual health, uh, negative stigma. For example, there's an increased rate of STIs among seniors. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're living longer, um, and people, because they're living longer, find themselves widowed or single and sexually active again later in life. Um, and we need to be able to break down those barriers of, of the stigma around Planned Parenthood and the, and the reproductive health care that we provide so that we can, we can address those issues. Yeah, and, and so, uh, so getting back to just, um, you know, one of the main focuses it seems to be when we're talking about this, and it's certainly in today's climates, this idea of abortion and, and the services, you know, the different providers of abortion in this country. But one of the statistics that maybe doesn't get mentioned as much is that abortions have been decreasing steadily over the last few decades. And, you know, what role has um, sex education uh, and uh, contraceptives, how, how, what role have they played in, in kind of seeing the trend go down? Or, or are there other causes maybe that we're not thinking of that have caused uh, abortions to decrease in this country? Well, there's, there's data that shows that there's a direct correlation between the reduced number of abortions and access to sexual health education and contraception. If you're educated and you have access um, to contraception, which, which helps to reduce unintended pregnancies, that will reduce the number of unintended pregnancies. And with a reduction of unintended pregnancies, there's going to be a reduction in abortion services that are needed. So there's, there's obviously a direct correlation. And having access to reproductive health care and sexual health education is vitally important to, um, to ensuring that the number of, of abortions continues to decrease. You know, and we have seen this switch in Iowa. Um, it wasn't that long ago that I was writing stories about this idea of spin one now or spin four or five later. Um, so the state of Iowa, maybe 2009, 2010, was actually increasing its family planning money um, with this, this idea that you want to spend that in the beginning, prevent the unplanned pregnancy, instead of spending more later on the safety net programs that are often needed um, for the mother and the child and, and you know, all of that. Um, so we, we have seen this kind of shift here in Iowa where now we're looking at, you know, we're not going to 
offer reimbursement to Planned Parenthood for these wonderful services that they provide because they also provide abortion. And I, I'm not sure exactly where that comes from because that's not the majority sentiment across the state. All right, well, uh, anything else you wanna say about that, Ray, at all? Well, I mean, I, I think it's, um, it, very important that you pointed out that the majority of Iowans are actually in support of, of Planned Parenthood for sure. I mean, we, we know that. 77% um, of Iowans, uh, including 62% of Republicans and evangelical Christians actually support public funding for the reproductive health care that Planned Parenthood provides. Very interesting. Now, <laughs> oh, I did want to uh, switch gears slightly here. Um, I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, and I don't know how much, when it comes to what has, I mean, how has science and technology improved, uh, you know, contraceptives, uh, women's health care? I mean, what are some of the, th I mean, if you look back 100 years ago or 200 years ago compared to where we are at today, it seems to me that uh, it's far more accessible, obviously, but uh, also much more safe. But I, I don't know if you could comment on just the, the progression and maybe where things are going to, to make this even more safe and effective for women? Sure, I mean, um, <clears throat> uh, currently women have more options than just the pill. You know, when um, years ago that was just sort of the, the standard go-to, but now we have um, so many different options like the Depo-Provera shot. We have long-acting reversible birth control options like IUDs and implants, which allows women and their doctors to make the best decision for their personal circumstances and their personal health mm -hmm. about the choices that they can that they have in front of them in terms of birth control options. We also have um, telemedicine, which allows low-income women who may have transportation barriers, who may not be able to get to providers, or rural women who might be isolated geographically. Telemedicine allows these women also to access reproductive health care in ways that they weren't able to before. So those kinds of advancements have actually increased the, um, the access that women have to reproductive health care and birth control. And Go ahead. And I was going to say, even within those categories, too, you've had advancements. Mm -hmm. You know, the birth control pill today is not the same pill it was five or ten years ago. IUDs have changed. At one point, IUDs were pulled off the market, and then they came out with a completely copper variety. Mm -hmm. um, so even within these different categories and what we have available, the options today are so much better Th than what our mothers had. And it's sure. interesting, uh, you know, just kind of researching for this show, it's amazing to, when you kind of look back at the history of women's health care and you see that, you know, at one time in this country it was illegal to, for a woman to uh, obtain any type of contraceptive and it was kind of demonized in a lot of ways. So, I mean, certainly there has been, uh, you know, progress made there and, and I think that's a, that's a very positive thing. Uh, I mean, what do you contribute that to, just kind of, the, you know, the, the acceptance of society when it comes to, you know, contraceptives and even, in the, you know, in, in many cases, abortion? Is there, um, I, I think it's, is it tied to just, hey, we see how our, our uh, world is flourishing, how women now have, many, have much more um, freedom, so on and so mm -hmm. forth? Is there... Oh, well, you know, you look back in time, you had the Comstock laws, which were basically what outlawed most forms of contraception, including condoms, which is pretty shocking to most people. But for about 65 years in this country, condoms were illegal. You couldn't receive them by mail. You um, weren't supposed to sell them. You weren't supposed to have them. Uh, matter of fact, it's when our men came back from World War I um, with uh, gonorrhea and syphilis. Um, that people started to go, wait a second, you know, maybe this isn't very healthy. You know, maybe we do want people protected, not just women, not just women who want to delay or space their pregnancies. But this is good for men too. This is good for all of society to be protected from disease. And, and I think also while, while we're no longer sort of battling the legality of contraception, certainly um, the issue of contraception and access to that is still on the table. That mm -hmm. still is a battle that we're that we're having to fight. And I think you raise a good point because sometimes people think that that issues like this and could extend to any other issue that they kind of move unopposed in a straight line forever, right? No, I mean there are societies that have retreated from these positions and have gone kind of backwards in a sense. And so you're right in the sense that you always have to kind of be, you know, keep the keep the uh, you know your foot on the pedal. 
for lack of a better term. And so you're constantly, you know, seeing that pushback. So I think that's very, very important. But it is fascinating just to, to think about how far we've come and, and even going back hundreds of years ago, what type of, you know, contraceptives were available. And, and we can thank science and, and, and technology for, for what we have today. And I think it's, uh, it certainly is a great thing. And it makes our lives a lot easier in a lot of ways, right? Um, so, uh, this kind of then kind of gets into, and you touched on just a little bit, but certainly in this country, I mean, we are one of the wealthiest countries in the world. You know, we have access to some of the best science and technology and healthcare that on the planet. But there are places around the world where that's, you know, not, not the case. And it probably changes the dynamic of the conversation when you are, and I know Planned Parenthood has a global footprint, right, and is doing a lot of good work around the world. Uh, I guess maybe, Ray, if you could talk just a little bit about sure. what, um, maybe what women are facing globally, what is Planned Parenthood doing there, sure. and then Linda, if you have any, any thoughts as well. Sure, right. um, so Planned Parenthood of the Heartland, obviously our, our primary focus is, is our service area of Iowa, Nebraska, but Planned Parenthood Global is working literally around the world, um, helping to increase access um, to reproductive health care, sexual health education, um, it actually, Planned Parenthood Global, I believe, is in, in partnership in 13 countries in Latin America and Africa, um, working on those specific issues. We know that, um, uh, that pregnancy in adolescent girls around the world is still one of the leading causes of death, so complications from pregnancies um, or, or uh, botched abortions. And so, um, so Planned Parenthood Global is, is working with our partners around the world to ensure that we have, um, that women across the, across the world have access to reproductive health care, so birth control, STD um, screening and, and prevention and treatment, um, as well as sexual health education to help them to be able to make choices. And, you know, as you've referenced a couple of times, to be able to plan whether or when they will become pregnant. Yeah, because for a lot of them, it's never been presented as an option, right? right it's right. like, I'm pregnant, now I have to, you know, give birth to this child or whatever. I don't have the ability to, uh, to uh, prevent a pregnancy. Right. And so that gives them, uh, gives them a choice. Linda, do you have some thoughts? Well, I was just going to say, I, I think we take so much for granted in this country. You know, we've forgotten that women did die in back alley abortions, um, that health was jeopardized, that families were torn apart. Um, still today, I think 13% of, of uh, maternal deaths are due to illegal abortion worldwide. So, I mean, this isn't an issue that's completely gone away. I just think that we're very fortunate to live where we do. And it's unfortunate that geography, um, both here at home and abroad, seems to be the determining factor on what access women have to health care. Mm. So what would you say is the, the, the single biggest challenge uh, facing women today when it comes to uh, reproductive health care? Trust. Um, I don't think society trusts women um, often enough or well enough. And if you look at what happened just this year in the legislature, um, the bill um, banning 20-week abortions as it was proposed, not how it passed, but as it was proposed, demanded that a woman seek guidance from her husband. And even if she was an adult and she was unmarried, she was supposed to get permission from her father. You know, I, I think that speaks volumes to how women are still viewed in society to a certain extent. Um, most people accept women in the workplace. They accept us in academia. Um, but there's still kind of this, this small fraction of society who would like to see women go back, who would like to see women perhaps have to defer or be submissive to a male. And it just comes down to trust. Um, the 20-week abortion ban to me only makes sense if you believe this narrative that women wake up 24 weeks along in a pregnancy and decide, I just don't want to be pregnant anymore. And I have never met a woman who was in that position. Um, every woman I've met who sought late-term abortion was like me and had problems within the pregnancy where 
they were looking at risks and options and they did the best that they could at that time. So I really wish as a society we would just decide to trust women. And I'll, I'll add to that and, and say that um, it's the, the, the single biggest problem um, from my perspective is, is part, trust is part of that. Um, but it's also that we have lawmakers, not only in the state of Iowa, but across the country, who are legislating the choices that women make about their own health care and the choices that they would, should be making with their doctors. Um, and so when we're faced with uh, lawmakers who are passing legislation that inhibits a woman, uh, woman's ability to make the best health care decision for herself, that is a huge problem. And when we're, you know, when, we, when we're constantly fighting um, to be able to have women to be able to have autonomy over their own bodies and to be able to make the best medical decision for themselves with the input of their doctors, um, that's a huge problem. Yeah. Right. When, when we were at, Pine, at our Pints and Politics events that we do for the Gazette, um, one of the things that I said, and, and this is true, and it kind of sums it all up how I feel about this, is that an Iowa farmer right now can offer more health assurances to his livestock than he can his wife. Yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot more progress to be made. There is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we definitely have a long way to go still. Right. And, and, you know, if somebody if, if somebody was sitting here and, they, you know, from a pro, let's say, uh, um, anti-abortion, pro-life, however you want to dis describe them. Uh, and if they if they were to sit here and say, well, in our you know, from our position, you know, it's a it's a uh, a battle between the, the, the baby's right and the mother's right. I mean, what is what what is your what would be your defense or a response, I should say, to, to that question of balancing kind of the right of the baby, if you will, to that of the mother. You know, I have been very adamant in opposing this 20-week abortion ban. Um, but I think what people may miss is if this was the opposite. It said any time something happened after 20 weeks that you had to abort, that women wouldn't have the choice of carrying to term if they felt that was the best option for them. I would be just as angry and upset about it. Um, it, you know, it goes back to that trust issue, right? Um, we should be able to let a woman, her husband, her loved ones, her partners, whomever is in her life, sit down with a doctor and have a conversation and decide what the best thing is. Um, and I, there's a, um, a lawmaker, his last name is Holt, I believe his first name is Stephen, and he tells a very passionate story about a child that was stillborn. And, and I feel for him. I mean, I have been in that situation. <laughs> but, you know, it still comes back to this idea that when a horrific thing happens, that you should be able to choose your own path forward, you know, as much as you can. And I don't see that happening here in Iowa. I don't see that happening nationally. I, I really f am fearful not so much for myself anymore because I think I'm past that point in my life. Um, but definitely, you know, I have two daughters. I have a son. I, I'm very concerned about what the future holds for them and if they'll be able to make medical choices based on fact and, instead of medical choices based on what someone else believes. Interesting. And Ray, what, what's, your, what's your thought on that? Um, <clears throat> you know, whether we're talking about the the um, that legislation that the original 20-week abortion ban, um, or just abortion services in general, um, you know, women have a a legally protected right to choose the health care that's best for them in those circumstances, and that's that's what we should honor. That's what women should be allowed to do, and and that should not be in question. And, and uh, Linda, you kind of raised the, the question that there, well, the co you made the comment that there's a lot of bad information out there, if you will, you know, a lot of misinformation when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, services that maybe Planned Parenthood provides or abortion in general or women's health care or contraceptives. I mean, you just hear all kinds of things. That, thank you, Internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of those is, is, is really around, you know, as far as, 
uh, you know, when when does, uh, you know, li what does science and technology and, and just healthcare, and what does it tell us about when life begins for, um, for a child, for a, a fetus? Um, what, what, what is the, I, you know, I don't know how close you are to this, but I mean, what is, um, what is the consensus on, or is there a consensus on when, uh, when life begins? There was a, a professor from Drake, I believe a biologist, I'm not sure of his credentials, but he was a professor at Drake, and he wrote a wonderful guest column for the Des Moines Register, which spoke directly to this issue. Um, and his thoughts were that this is a being, but this is not a sentient being. And therefore, the needs of the sentient being, being the mother, um, should prevail in a court of law. So looking at it strictly from that kind of legal analysis, um, that's where he came. You know, I have heard some scientists say that they don't know. Um, I've heard some scientists say that they do know. Um, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know exactly when life begins. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it's a wonderful ethical question. Mm -hmm. But in this country, um, we had a son who was a full-term stillborn. Um, so he never lived outside of the womb. I was kind of shocked when we got to the end of the year that I could not list him on my taxes. And, and not that I couldn't take the deduction, but I couldn't even list him. So from that government standpoint, this government which has been so crazy about you know, life begins here or life begins there or trying yeah. to pinpoint that, uh -huh. you know, that they didn't recognize, you know, this child that I carried for nine months. Oh, yeah. No, and thank you for sharing that. And, and um, we're kind of getting close to the end of the show here and we've gotten into a lot of deep and, you know, issues here. But I wanted to kind of end with both of you um, talking a little bit about if someone was passionate about women's reproductive health care, uh, what can they do practically in their community today to help advance uh, women's health care? Vote, number one. <laughs> Vote for lawmakers who support women's reproductive health. Um, educate yourself on the issues um, that you're, you're faced with in your local community at the state level and also at the federal level. Um, get involved, support uh, the, the, the providers of reproductive health in your community. And if I didn't say it before, vote. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank and you. I think be willing to speak up. Um, I, I think especially with um, older women in Iowa, who didn't have the same educational opportunities that younger women did, it's very important that when you're sitting there with your mom and your mom's friends and, and whomever else you meet, you know, your young daughters as well, to just be able to use your voice and not be afraid to say that, hey, I trust women. Mm. Very good. And I can tell both of you are very passionate about what you do. And thank you very much for... Uh, coming on the show this morning and sharing with what is a very, very important issue uh, to a lot of people and sometimes a difficult subject for people to talk about, but certainly a very, very important one. And that is, again, women's health care and women's reproductive health care in this case. But again, uh, thank you this morning for uh, joining us here on Ethical Perspectives on the News. And I hope you'll be able to join us here next week as, we've, uh, as we look at other issues facing Iowans and, the other, and those around the country. Thank you very much and have a great morning.